We will begin our webinar in two minutes. We will begin our webinar in two minutes. Testing, testing. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's webinar, which is CSP and well-being within the framework for junior cycle. My name is Olive O'Connell. I am a classroom teacher in Step Aside Educate Together Secondary School. I teach CSP and I've taught CSP for the past 12 years or so. So I'll be co-presenting tonight um, with my colleague Mela Cusack. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mela Cusack. Um, I am a lecturer in CSPE in DCU and I've been a member of the JCT short course team since 2013. So tonight's learning intentions, we're going to explore the CSP curricular options available within the well-being area of learning. Um, and then we're going to move on to look at how CSP will be reported as part of well-being. Um, so hopefully your questions will be answered during that. Um, we're going to start off looking at the vision for well-being um, overall. Um, and this uh, works um, in four main areas. First of all, it will be building on existing practice within your schools. Um, so we're very aware that uh, schools around the country are doing loads of work already on well-being. And the well-being area um, is formalizing what a lot of us have been doing for a long time. So in this instance, we're talking about pastoral care systems, student supports, um, programs like induction programs, student council, and the general classroom atmosphere that we build on a daily basis. Um, in the wellbeing guidelines, we're also being asked to build on or to promote student voice in developing their approach to wellbeing in a collaborative manner. We're recognizing that well-being is now an area of learning um, and we're being asked to adopt a whole school approach to supporting and promoting well-being and this requires looking at the following four aspects of school um, 
<laughs> the first one is school culture. So um, the school mission and ethos, um, the physical and social environment of the school, and also the culture in the classroom. Um, and we'd also be thinking about um, the teaching and learning and the approaches to assessment that are used there. In terms of curriculum then, um, it refers to the curriculum components in junior cycle where students explicitly learn about well-being. And we'll be looking more closely at this category as our webinar goes on. Um, we'll also be looking at policy and planning, um, school policies, school self-evaluation, um, and subject and whole school planning and CPD planning. Um, in terms of relationships then, we're talking about what are the relationships in your school like between students and teachers, peer relationships, students' uh, voice, and links with parents and the outside community. Um, we're concentrating on this area um, and it's well underpinned by research. Um, if we think about Emer Smith's research on growing up in Ireland study, um, the emphasis was on students doing well when their relationships are built effectively with their teachers. Um, so we're just going to look at well-being as an area of learning. Um, so this um, is Sorry, this is um, includes the curricular areas of CSPE, PE, and SPHE. Um, other areas uh, included maybe guidance related learning, and they also may include other areas which a school can choose to provide. Uh, the minimum amount of hours for well being will be 300 hours. Uh, from 2017, and that will move to 400 hours from 2020. Um, and all this information is in the framework for junior cycle. Um, so if we have another quick look or if we had a, a more in-depth look at the minimum thresholds of time, the minimum of 300 hours of timetabled engagement from 2017 will look like this. Um, the minimum contact time for CSP is 70 hours. Um, which there will also be 135 hours of PE and 70 hours of SPHE. And what those figures represent are basically the provisions that exist at the moment. So 70 hours um, is provided in one 40 minute class per week over three years. Um, so that's for CSP and SPHE and PE then is the two class periods per week. Um, schools have flexibility to allocate more time to these areas in line with their priorities and their students' needs if they see fit. Um, so this slide shows one example of the breakdown of the 300 hours, um, but there is room for flexibility there. Um, in 2020, when the amount of time is increased to 400 hours, um, there, there will be more decisions to be made here. The minimum thresholds still exist, so CSP is still 70 hours, PE is 135 and SPHE is 70, but now the other well-being related learning is 125 hours. So that 125 hours can be made up um, from increasing the contact time for the subjects, CSP, PE and SPHE. Um, schools can also create or can, schools can also offer shorter units based on learning outcomes from these subject areas. Um, and they can also include guidance related learning, pastoral care perhaps. Um, school provided courses or units that address an aspect of well-being that is important for their students and elements of other subjects that are clearly linked to important learning for well-being. Um, school initiatives like retreats, awareness days, etc., which involve all students may be included. Um, and relevant courses and units developed by outside agencies and organisations may also be included. Um, the well-being guidelines include eight well-being sample programs, and it might be useful to look at these. Um, they're not, uh, we're, so we're now we're going to focus our attention on why CSP fits into the well-being area of learning. 
Um, so this is a quote from the World Health Organization um, referenced in the Junior Cycle Wellbeing Guidelines. Um, if you just take a minute to reflect on the quote and see if you can identify any word or phrase that links to your understanding of CSP and what it is about. Um, so we just meant to say tonight that on the right hand side of your page um, you can input questions if you have any and we have um, some colleagues in the room who will be answering your questions online and um, there are also four documents on the right hand side of the page and um, some of the documents we will be talking about tonight um, and they will be handy links for you. Um, so if we go back to our World Health Organization quote, um, I suppose as a CSPE teacher and um, the things that jump out to me are the end um, part, a sense of purpose and belonging to a wider community and that seems to resonate a lot with CSPE teachers. I think if we look at it in a little bit more in a little more depth um, that more than that will come to the fore so students realize their abilities um, which is about student voice obviously which has always been a part of CSP and that students can also cope with the normal stresses of life and um, that again is always a part of CSP discussing current affairs and helping students deal with the world around them. Um, so these are the reasons why CSP is part of the um, area of learning entitled well-being. So these are our indicators of well-being. You may be familiar with them if um, you've had your second JCT day. Um, there are six indicators of well-being um, and they are closely linked to the short course specification for CSP. Um, the first one, active, um, probably doesn't relate so much to CSP as it's about being physically active. Um, the others, though, of course, are closely connected to CSP as a classroom subject and to the short course specification. Um, if we look at the language in them, um, the language is very student-centered as opposed to teacher-centered. Um, do I take action to protect and promote my well-being and that of others is written for the students to assess their own progress in these areas. Um, if we look at the short course and how the indicators are mapped onto it. Um, nine of the learning outcomes of the short course um, are mapped onto the responsible indicator. There are 34 in the connected category, seven in resilient, 23 in respected and 19 in aware. So we can see that CSP fits very closely or very tidily within the well-being area of learning. So CSP then within the framework for junior cycle. Um, CSP is informed with the is informed by these key documents. So we have our framework for junior cycle from 2015, our well-being guidelines, um, which outline the entire area of well-being, um, our circular letter 15 of 2017, um, which has all your essential information for CSPE and um, which can be downloaded from education.ie um, that is the short course specification for CSPE and there is also um, the the assessment guidelines or the classroom based assessment um, for CSPE as well and um, so those are your key documents for CSPE um, and uh, you'll be using those. So the options then for students studying CSP is that all students must study CSP as part of the new area of well-being. And the options available to them um, are that they can continue to study the junior cycle syllabus um, of CSP, which was introduced in 1996, the 70-hour course, or they can study the specification for the junior cycle short course, which was introduced in 2016. Or alternatively, they can, inter they can study um, shorter units based on 
uh, based on the learning outcomes of the Wellbeing Short courses, which are CSPE, PE, or SPHE. Okay, um, this is Mela now, and I've just taken over from Olive for the next uh, few slides, so we're doing a bit of a double act. Um, some of you are probably teaching the 1996 syllabus, um, but you may be thinking about moving to the short course specification um, as the allocation of wellbeing hours increases in the years up to 2020. So we thought it would be a good idea to do um, a little bit of mapping of the syllabus onto the specification, just so as we could look at the similarities between the two documents. Documents. And we'll start with the CSP syllabus. Um, so this was designed for 70 hours of student engagement over three years. Um, and there were two approaches with the, the 96 syllabus. You could do the seven concept approach or the unit approach. Um, the concept approach tended to be the more popular one. And the seven concepts were human dignity, human rights and social responsibilities, stewardship, development, interdependence, democracy and law. And the unit approach was designed around four units. And those were the individual and citizen, the community, the state, Ireland, and then Ireland and the world. Um, so, so Formative assessment was the main method of assessment in um, the CSP syllabus um, in terms of the 60% that was allocated for the uh, report on action pro uh, project or the coursework assessment booklet and then the 40% um, went in terms of more summative assessment for the terminal exam. Um, so it's really important to note that the 96 syllabus, um, which had some really positive and uh, very forward thinking elements that are reflected in a lot of the junior cycle reform that is ongoing at the moment, um, but it wasn't framed with the eight principles or the 24 statements or the eight key skills at its core, and it wasn't written with uh, a learning outcomes format um, and that's unlike the short course specification that was published in 2016. Um, so this specification was developed in tandem with junior cycle developments including um, the well-being area of learning which Olive has um, talked you through. It is designed for approximately 100 hours of student engagement um, it is written in a learning outcomes format, um, like all of the new specifications that are being produced by the NCCA, and there are three strands um, with 37 learning outcomes across those strands in the, the new short course specification. Um, in terms of assessment, it includes one classroom-based assessment, an action record, which is both a formative and a summative task. Um, an achievement in relation to the short course can be profiled on the junior cycle profile of achievement. So if we look at the structure of the 96 syllabus in comparison to the short course structure, you can see the seven concepts um, outlined there on the left hand side and then the short course strand titles outlined on the right hand side and you can probably already see that there is some overlap so you've got rights and responsibilities as um, a concept in the 96 syllabus and then the first strand in the short course is rights and responsibilities um, if we do a very broad mapping of those seven concepts in the 96 syllabus onto the learning outcomes in the the specification strands, um, you can see that the concepts of human dignity and rights and responsibilities uh, are very much present in the learning outcomes in strand one, rights and responsibilities. Stewardship, development and interdependent concepts are very much present in the second strand, so the global citizenship strand. And then law, interdependence and democracy are present in the learning outcomes in the third strand, exploring democracy. It is important at this stage also to highlight the fact that strand one, rights and responsibilities, is the foundational strand. And that is also very much in keeping with the practice in relation to the 96 syllabus, where um, human rights documents like the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Declaration um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights were foundational documents. So in a sense, um, that, that strength has been carried through from the syllabus into the short course specification. Um, if you want to access 
any of the those documents, either the 96 um, syllabus document or the 2016 short course specification, then the place to go is curriculumonline.ie. Um, if you click on the junior cycle tab up along the top there um, and then click on short courses, you will be led to a drop down menu that brings you into um, a short courses list, including CSP. Just click on CSP and uh, you're then brought to this page. And you can see there in the blue buttons on the right hand side, you've got the short course curriculum specification the assessment guidelines, um, annotated examples of student work are um, due to be uploaded um, sometime early in the next school year. And then you've also got the, the pre-2017 syllabus, so the 96 document. So all of those documents are available there. And in fact, some of them are available in this webinar now on the right hand side as well. And, and we'll be talking you through some of those in more detail as the webinar progresses. Um, so let's look a little bit more now in depth at the CSP short course. Um, so the template for the short course is, is very similar to what you might be familiar with in terms of the new specifications for subjects that you're also teaching. So you've got your introduction to junior cycle, your rationale section, the aim, the, the links, so in terms of links to statements of learning and also links to key skills, um, an overview of the course, which gives you some brief information about the three strands. And then you've got the learning outcomes uh, section, which is the expectations for student students, followed by um, some information about assessment and reporting. And then you've got um, an appendix. You, you'll probably notice from other subject specifications that there can be more uh, than one appendix, but with short courses, there tends to be just the one. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is actually to um, use the link on the right hand side of your screen to open up the CSP spe short course specification to page 11. And I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that because we're going to then ask you to do a task um, in some of the slides that follow. Um, one of our JCT colleagues has just informed us that there are quite a number of questions coming in about the uh, exam in CSPE. So just to clarify, um, after 2019, so after June 2019, the State Exams Commission will have no involvement in assessment. Um, so after that it becomes either a school designed assessment or if you're doing the short course, um, you can use the uh, action record, so the classroom-based assessment that's laid out in the specification and in the assessment guidelines. But I suppose just bear with us for a moment because we're going to come to some further detail on that as the webinar progresses. Um, so just to remind people um, that learning outcomes, all of these specifications are written in a learning outcomes format. Um, are th so there are statements in curriculum specifications that describe the knowledge, understanding, skills and values that students should be able to demonstrate after a period of learning. So learning outcomes are not just about content. Um, and what we'd like you to do for a moment, you've got your specification open now, hopefully on page 11. If you would just take a minute to look at the strand one learning outcomes uh, and see whether or not you can identify where the skills are. So where the key skills are in the learning outcomes in that first strand element, say. So in the learning outcomes 1.1 to 1.5. And I'll give you a moment to do that.
And now what I'd like you to do is find a learning outcome in the st second strand element, so the human rights instrument strand element. So that's the learning outcomes 1.6 to 1.12. Um, and I'd like you to look for evidence of obvious content. Okay, so, so if we interrogate those learning outcomes in strand one and indeed across the three strands of the short course, then what you hopefully will notice, have noticed is that there are um, a balance of knowledge, skills and values across the learning outcomes. Um, and there's an element of crossover between a number of the learning outcomes. So for example, you may have noticed that learning outcomes 1.2 and 1.3 both mention needs. So it's not a case that, um, that you encounter content just in relation to one learning outcome and never encounter it again. There is an element of deliberate crossover between the content in the various learning outcomes. Um, and, and this means that they're global learning outcomes. So you're not supposed to just encounter each learning outcome maybe on one occasion, but um, through case studies or stories or through the content that you have actually chosen in relation to a particular learning outcome, you may also be touching off other learning outcomes or revisiting learning outcomes on multiple occasions. Uh, and the key skills are embedded in the learning outcomes and the way that they're embedded is through the action verb at the start of each learning outcome. So you will see words at the start of each of the, of the learning outcomes in strand one like discuss, communicate, create, assemble, share, reflect. Um, and that is, I suppose, an articulation of the key skills because it indicates that the students will be doing something, you know, that they will be putting those key skills into practice um, through discussing, through communicating, creating, assembling and so on. Um, and those action verbs are a really important tool for you because they provide you with the support for building those key skills into your classroom planning. So they will help you to decide what methodologies that you're going to be using on any given day with a particular learning outcome in focus. Um, so they suggest different activities or methodologies that you can use. And you will also notice that those action verbs are predominantly higher, higher order, which again is deliberate. Um, I want to, to maybe highlight the reflect learning outcome. So it is that learning outcome is the last in each of the three strands. It's reflect on what you have learned in this strand. And the idea is not that you will reflect when you come to the end of all of the teaching and learning in a strand, but that reflection will be continuous as you go through. So there should be an element of reflection actually in relation to everything that you do in your classrooms. Um, the learning outcomes indicate a potential use for uh, ICT. Um, so if you look, say, at learning outcomes 1.1, create a visual representation, or 1.7, where students are asked to create a timeline, um, or indeed the reflection learning outcome at the end of each of the strands, there's lots of potential there for the use of technology. So they could create a timeline using ICT, and um, they could use a collage maker to create a visual representation. They could reflect via a blog. Um, and it is also deliberately intended that the learning outcomes will include all students. And um, so, for example, if you look, there's a very specific, um, I suppose, example that we can look at in terms of learning outcome 1.7, which says create a timeline tracing the origin of the concept of human rights, showing five or more key dates, events, people and documents. And um, so this suggests a minimum. The minimum is five, but it does allow for more. And so there's differentiation written into some of the learning outcomes. Um, and the, the learning outcomes are universally designed. So um, students we know come from a wide range of backgrounds and they have lots of different interests and needs um, and capacities. And these courses have been designed to be as universal, universal as is feasible. Um, so the learning outcomes should provide 
valuable and meaningful learning opportunities for students from all cultural and social um, backgrounds, as well as those from a wide variety of individual circumstances. Um, and this means that, you know, where it happens well, that uh, learning is very accessible to everybody, including students with special educational needs. Um, and given that it's CSP, it's also very important that uh, the learning outcomes in this subject area in particular, or this short course, would promote student voice. Um, so again, that goes back to the definition, the World Health Organization definition of well-being that we saw earlier on, the, the idea that student capacity would be um, supported in, in the well-being area of learning. So if you look, say, for example, at learning outcome 1.6, it's about students sharing stories of individuals or groups who inspired them because of their work for human rights. So students have the opportunity to use their voice in relation to things that they care about. Um, and the final bullet point on the screen is about the fact that the learning outcomes in the short course are mapped onto the well-being indicators, um, as Olive mentioned before. Um, in the wellbeing guidelines document, uh, the CSP short course, along with the SPHE and um, PE short courses, all of those learning outcomes and how they map onto the wellbeing indicators are, are, are actually um, given and outlined. Um, so we're just going to move on now to look at time requirements, which I know is an area of great interest to a lot of people. Um, so the short courses require approximately 100 hours of student uh, engagement. If you are in a school um, where you've got 40 minute classes, um, this means that one class a week in first year, two in second year and one in third year would bring you to a total of 88 hours, which is the minimum class contact time that would be acceptable for you to be able to say that you are doing a short course. Um, obviously, you could do two classes a week in first, one in second and one in third, or indeed two in second and two in third year. It's up to you um, how you actually organize it in that respect. But uh, the minimum re timetable requirement would be 88 hours, and it would be expected that you would make up the additional 12 hours in terms of um, work that the students would be doing outside of their timetabled hours in relation to CSP. So um, for instance, if and when they took uh, an action in relation to a human rights issue that concerned them, then that would account for some of that 12 hours of time, whatever shape that action might take. If you're in a, a school that has 60 minute classes, so in the second scenario there, what you see is that you need to offer one class a week in first, one in second and one in third year. And that brings you to a total of 99 hours, meaning that some of the um, the activity that I'd outlined for the first scenario there could actually take time, take place during your timetable hours in that second scenario. Um, if you look at the junior cycle wellbeing guidelines, there's a quote on page 54 that says Appendix A makes explicit the links between the wellbeing indicators and the learning outcomes of the NCCA short courses in CSP, SPHE and PE. So I've mentioned that previously. Um, but if your school chooses not to include these short courses as part of their wellbeing program, planning in these subjects should be done using Appendix I. Now, this is really important. Appendix I is the last appendix in the wellbeing guidelines, and it's available on page um, 104. Um, if you are doing something other than the CSP short course um, designed and published by the NCCA, then you need to actually fill out Appendix I. So it's really worth your while having a look at that appendix and, and um, coming to grips with what it actually entails. Um, and we are aware that there are quite a number of schools out there that are still um, timetable for 70 hours, they're still um, on the minimum requirement in terms of CSPE in the well-being area of learning. So we thought that it would be worthwhile spending some time um, going through some advice about how to map your short course learning outcomes onto the 70 hour time allocation. Um, so this is in a case where you've decided that you're no longer going to do the 1990, follow the 1996 syllabus, that you're going to follow um, learning outcomes from the short course, but that you haven't got sufficient timetabled allocation to say that you are 
actually doing a short course. So you're just using the short course learning outcomes onto your 70 hour allocation. Um, and this is probably the reality for a lot of people at the moment, particularly schools that might eventually like to move to the, um, the 100 hours of the short course. Um, it's a really practical, I suppose, transition step um, between moving from the 96 syllabus um, to the 2016 uh, specification. Um, and as with uh, everything with regards to junior cycle reform, I suppose the first thing to say is that you should be guided by local context, um, meaning your student interests and their needs. Um, so you may be doing some great work in CSPE and you need to find uh, and get familiar enough with the learning outcomes um, in the short course specification to figure out how what you've been doing up until now and how it is, how the things that your students have really gravitated to and are interested in how they can map onto the the learning outcomes in the short course specification um and and you know so you you're going to take that good practice and you're going to try and continue it and find the learning outcome that you can hook it onto um, another important thing is to remember that this strand one is the foundational strand. So rights and responsibilities are foundational. And um, so you really need to think about those learning outcomes um, as being the ones that you study first um, and also as maybe having a, a bit more weight than the learning outcomes that come in strand two and strand three. Um, However, it is important to offer a broad and balanced program to your students. And with that in mind, um, it would also be important to consider uh, dealing with learning outcomes from across the three strands. So it wouldn't um, be acceptable to actually leave out learning outcomes from say a, a bunch of learning outcomes in a strand element. Um, You've got 70 hours. Uh, in the past, that 70 hours has included preparation for a terminal exam, and it has included um, also the writing up of the report on the action project or the keeping of the, the QAB. Um, so it would be important with 70 hours and dealing with the short course learning outcomes that you would pick a meaningful, but also manageable for you and for your students uh, means of assessment. Um, it is possible in the 70 hours to go to the short course assessment guidelines and to actually do the classroom based assessment as your means of assessment. Um, but you will not be able to record uh, a 70 hour use of sh um, short course learning outcomes and classroom based assessment as a short course on the students JCPA. Um, also of importance is uh, to remember that there are learning outcomes that are mentioned in the assessment guidelines as being main learning outcomes um, that, that need to be uh, covered in terms of the classroom-based assessment. Um, you do, don't have to cover all of these learning outcomes, but if you're doing a strand one related action, for instance, you would probably need to be covering the strand one learning outcomes that are identified on page nine of your assessment guidelines. And the assessment guidelines, as we mentioned earlier, are available on curriculumonline.ie and they're also there um, for you right now to access via the list of documents on the right hand side of your screen. Um, so all this summed up means that schools can incorporate shorter units based on learning outcomes from the NCC short, a short course in CSP and that is outlined in the wellbeing uh, guidelines. And I'm going to hand back over to Olive now. So if you ha have any questions on the um, CSP short course and learning outcomes or the mapping onto the of uh, of short course learning outcomes onto the 70 hours, you can use the question facility on the right hand side and our colleagues will try and answer those. Okay, thanks very much, Mela. Um, so now we're gonna speak a little bit about um, assessment and about reporting. Um, so as you can see on your screen there, it's expected that most of the assessment activities in the area of well-being will be classroom-based and formative in nature. Um, so this is 
uh, this is no surprise really to those of us who are delivering um, junior cycle subjects. Um, what this will look like in practice really is that there will be um, a, a whole range of activities that your students can engage in um, that we can use as assessment. Um, so they may be engaged in self-assessment, um, there will be reflection and as Mela has said that's built into the learning outcomes in the three strands of the short course. Um, we may also assess through project work um, where students are engaging with their peers in a collaborative manner in the classroom. Um, they may be involved in presentations um, or also performance um, or more traditional assignments. Um, and there will also be peer assessment. Um, so there is a, a, a range there and there are only some suggestions of the of the assessment techniques that may be used um, in, in well-being. Um, so if we move on to reporting then, um, student work in CSPE um, will be assessed in school and reported upon um, by the school. So this reporting will happen throughout the three years of junior cycle and it may also happen on the junior cycle profile of achievement. Um, if we go back to the circular that we referred to earlier, which is circular 15 of 2017, um, it states that reporting on the progress of students will happen annually um, in first year and second year in the reports and also through the composite junior cycle profile of achievement um, after the end of third year. Um, and this will complement reporting on the progress of parents and guardians, or, or on students to parents and guardians in the normal manner that we report to students at parent, or that we report to parents at parent teacher meetings and through normal student feedback sessions, um, including the feedback after each CBA. Um, this is supported from the quote from a quote from the framework for junior cycle, which says that during the three years of junior cycle, oral and written feedback to parents and students will be essential in supporting the student to build on strengths and address areas where learning can improve. And this is the stuff that we do every day as teachers. Um, it's important to note, as we said earlier, that CSP will no longer be assessed by the State Exams Commission after 2019. So our current second years will be the last cohort of students to sit the State Examinations Commission um, CSP paper and the last ones to submit a written um, report on the action project or a coursework assessment booklet. Um, so after 2019 then assessment is purely school-based. Um, so reporting can be supported by using those learning intentions um, that Mela spoke about which arise out of the learning outcomes and by providing students with success criteria to help support um, to support them in production of work and to help them um, develop their skills. Um, we will also be expected to make feedback accessible for students and parents obviously and um, that we would there will be ongoing communication on students progress and um, in all of this we need to keep in mind that uh, as teachers we have to make sure it's manageable for us so if we go back to our raft of assessment methods um, earlier on and um, peer assessment and self-assessment um, would be very useful in in that regard um, we also need to be cognizant obviously of our students self-esteem as we always are and of their well-being and um, so with suitable success criteria and um, it's it's easier to bring those students along and to be more inclusive of all students um, in terms of supports from you, um, in the links document which has been shared with you tonight, um, which is down the right hand side of your page, um, there are focus on learning toolkits which have been developed by the NCCA there. Um, there is one on learning intentions and success criteria about how to devise those and write them. Um, there's one on effective questioning. There's also one on formative feedback and one on students reflecting on their learning. Um, these are useful guides to the classroom teacher and they help, they're, they're good supports for you in the classroom. Um, there will also be reporting guidelines uh, which are the focus of the upcoming leadership CPD workshops which commence after Easter. Um, so CSP can, it, can appear then on the junior cycle profile of achievement document. Um, students may profile their achievement 
through the CBA if they have completed the 100 hour short course um, and if they have completed the classroom based assessment. Um, if students have participated in the 100 hour short course but not undertaken a CBA, or if they've completed or participated in the 70 hour CSP course, then their engagement can be profiled in the other areas of learning which appear on the junior cycle profile of achievement. Um, the key messages here are that most of the assessment for act activity for CSP will be formative in nature, that students can profile their achievement through the CBA and that work in the CBA will be assessed by the teacher to a national standard and reported upon to parents and guardians by the school. Um, and the assessment guidelines for the CSP short course provide detailed advice on assessment in general and the CBAs in particular and other practical issues as well. So if we just have a look at the junior cycle profile of achievement, um, hopefully it will make things a little bit clearer. So this is what your overall junior cycle profile of achievement or JCPA will look like. Down the left hand side we have our subjects that are studied. Um, on the right hand side at the top, we have classroom based assessments in your various subjects. Underneath that is your classroom based assessment short courses. And at the bottom on the right hand side is your other areas of learning. So this is your, um, your subject face here um, with your grades. Um, then we have our classroom based assessments for our subjects and our short courses. So CSP would be recorded in the classroom based assessments for short courses and the grading system that's used are descriptors. So there are four descriptors. One is yet to meet expectations. The next is in line with expectations. Then we have um, a above expectations and exceptional. So those are your four descriptors which can be awarded and they are awarded um, on a national standard as we said already um, and uh, exemplar material will be posted so that teachers can can discern what the national standard actually is in order to grade those assessments that their students complete. Um, but as we said, assessment is mainly formative in CSP. Um, it only is effectively becomes summative once they finally um, submit their, their very final write-up on their citizenship action. Um, so other areas of learning um, is important for CSP if you're in a position where you're not offering the short course or they're not sitting the CSP exam. So CSP can be recorded in this section of the JCPA. Um, and here you would say that students have engaged with CSP um, as a subject. Um, and as we said already, um, the CSP exam will no longer be available after June 2019. Okay, so the supports then that are available for you, I'm going to pass you back to Mela. Okay, so we've we've encountered a lot of these documents um, already in tonight's webinar, and most of them are available through the links document on the right hand side, or as indeed as separate links themselves. So the wellbeing guidelines are there. Um, this the short course specification, the guidelines for the classroom-based assessment. Um, it is also anticipated that there will be a learning and assessment review meeting uh, for classroom-based assessments. Um, if you find that you are the only CSP teacher in your school, um, then uh, the recommendation is that you would actually um, try to link up with a CSP colleague in another school and that you would investigate ICT possibilities where this is concerned. Um, and we've mentioned on a number of occasions that the NCCA is currently working with a group of CSP teachers on annotating examples of student work. So that student work will include examples of um, everyday uh, tasks, but it will also include ex annotated examples of sample um, CBAs, so sample action records for CSPE. And it is anticipated that those annotated examples will be available on curriculumonline.ie in early 2018-2019 uh, school year. Um, 
Here's a quote from the framework for Junior Cycle, um, which recognises the importance of professional de development and collaboration between teachers for informing their understanding of teaching, learning and assessment and in their practice in the classroom. So I suppose um, in a sense, this is the rationale for the learning and assessment review meetings, but it also underpins the importance of um, engaging with JCT uh, continuing professional development opportunities um, for CSP as um, as the, the implementation of CSP progresses from first year to third year. Um, and we do know that in the majority of cases that um, that a lot of teachers that are timetable to teach CSP or indeed SPHE haven't actually completed an initial um, teacher education module or qualification in those um, short course areas. Um, and for this reason, the wellbeing guidelines talks about the importance of these teachers being facilitated to attend um, CPD uh, sessions like webinars or um, in-service days um, and it's uh, this I suppose quote is um, maybe something that if you feel that you um, need more professional development or that you would like to uh, take advantage of the JCT opportunities that it's a quote that you, that you can um, uh, use in discussions with school management um, and in light of this quote we thought it was also important um, to get a sense of what your professional development needs in relation to CSP and well-being might be in the future following on from um, your participation in this webinar. So there is um, in your links document on the right hand side, there is a link to a survey. Um, it's on the second page. Sorry, somebody was just giving me a heads up there about where exactly it was. And um, so it's on the second page of the links document. And it is a survey that will really help us to structure and design um, our CPD for CSP teachers um, from next year onwards. So we want to structure and design our CPD on the basis of actual needs um, and requirements that are out there um, amongst CSP teachers. So I'm actually going to give you a few minutes to fill out that survey. It's very important information information for us and it's mostly tick box I think there's only one or two open-ended questions but I really would encourage you to actually fill that out because obviously it'll help us to meet your needs
Okay, so if you haven't uh, finished completing the survey, obviously you can you can do that after um, the webinar finishes, and we're nearly at the end now. Um, but we just wanted to highlight what the program of continuing professional development for the next school year is. So um, CSPE will be uh, in service will be on offer by JCT um, in September and October in the next school year, um, commencing on the 10th of September. And those in services will happen via the education centers nationally. And um, so we would encourage you to flag that maybe with your school management um, because they will need to register you for that CPD. Um, through the usual uh, site, which is jctregistration.ie. Um, and that registration will be open shortly. Um, and just to end, we would like to highlight some of the further supports. So obviously, we've got two teams that are in JCT that are very uh, involved in CSP um, continuing professional development. So the wellbeing team and the short courses team. Um, and the contact details for both of those teams are avail available on jct.ie. Um, additionally, within the PDST or the Professional Development Service for Teachers, you've got a wellbeing team and professional learning communities. Um, and also the special education support service is um, worth mentioning in terms of their work around inclusive practice. And we'd like to finish up this evening, I suppose, coming back around full circle um, to that idea of CSP in the well-being area of learning and with a quote, I suppose a reflective quote, maybe for you to go away with, um, from a director of education and skills with the OECD, so the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, and he said, schools are the first place where children experience society in all its facets, and their experiences can have a profound influence on their attitudes and behavior in life. And um, we would feel that CSP is very much part of that profound uh, influence, and we would encourage you to engage with us um, in our CPD program as uh, time progresses and we'd like to thank you very much um, on behalf of myself and Olive and our um, other silent partners here answering your questions uh, John and Anne for your participation this evening and we hope to meet you face to face in the future thank you